nuclear reactor. The neutrinos from the sun are known with 1% uh, uncertainty, which is better than what we know today from, for example, for nuclear reactor. What does the sun do? Uh, we published in uh, 2011, uh, uh, reviews of modern physics. This is the, uh, the, the ultimate um, publication of this, a workshop that John Bacall organized in, uh, uh, 2000, in 1999 and then in 2010. Um, and all of these details are from this uh, workshop. So the sun first burned two hydrogen to make deuterium and it has to emit neutrino. This is a weak interaction process. Lucky for us, other than, otherwise the sun will go in a poof. Uh, weak interaction uh, dictate that the sun will live for about 10 billion years. So neutrino is immersed over here. We produce helium three uh, and then helium three and helium four can make beryllium seven. And that's again, neutrinos emitted. We call them beryllium-7 neutrino. 14% of the time we emit these neutrinos. And then since we have beryllium-7, we can make fusion reaction to make boron-8. Again, neutrinos are emitted. So we have neutrino type, three type. Uh, what is happening? Uh, okay, so now let's, let's have an introduction to nuclear astrophysics. I call it nuclear astrophysics while standing on one foot. I, I cannot stand for too long on one foot. So in a star, we have an element B plus X interacting to produce C plus, uh, C plus gamma, for example. In the notation of nuclear physics, the cross section sigma will be designated B, X, Y. So B plus X goes to Y plus C. So for example, if this is carbon and alpha particle, this will be C12 alpha gamma. I'm losing some notation. Uh, unfortunately, we all speak with a certain language. Uh, the cross section might have a resonance and has a direct component. It changed by four orders, nine orders of magnitude. The main change is due to the repulsion of the Coulomb barrier. B and X have to interact with each other. They have to penetrate through the Coulomb barrier. So we take the Coulomb barrier effect with a gamma of penetrability factor, e to the power two pi eta, where eta is a Sonnefeld parameter. Um, then we multiply the cross section and we take most of this nine orders of magnitude away. The cross section is uh, quantum mechanics tells us pi over k square. So I multiply by the energy and I take all the kinematics out. What's left behind is the astrophysical cross section factor. Now, instead of nine orders of magnitude, I only talk about a factor of 10. This is where the nuclear physics is. Everything over here is kinematics, I take it out. So we measure in a laboratory and we need to extrapolate to the stellar condition. How do we know the stellar condition? Well, the cross section dives out exponentially. It might have a resonance, but anyhow, the majority is exponential dive down. The velocities in the star, this distribution, Maxwellian distribution, so convolution, of the velocity with the cross section gives us a window over here. We call the gamma window, and that's the most efficient energy for stellar burning. And that's all you need to know about nuclear astrophysics. So John Bacall put together this entire uh, 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 reaction network and calculated the spectrum of uh, neutrinos. So there is the PP neutrino, the beryllium-7 neutrino, we will concentrate on the boron-8 solar neutrino. The boron-8 solar neutrino, which we measured in Superkamiokanda and snow, I'm sure you uh, all know about this. They go up to about 15 and 17 MeV, and the threshold for the detection is about 5 MeV. And that's the spectrum that uh, John Bacall uh, published. But immediately it became a problem. In the year 2000, when John Bacall was talking about this, the cross section, the nuclear physics cross section, the proton plus beryllium seven going to, um, uh, to boron eight plus gamma, what we will call beryllium seven P gamma. So again, beryllium seven plus proton, and we detect the gamma. So that's why I call it beryllium seven P gamma. In your back of your mind, you should have beryllium seven plus P going to boron eight plus gamma. And this is declared to be the most important nuclear physics measurement. 
And he went around and gave talk to all nuclear physicists, whoever would listen to him, please do this measurement. And I happened to be one of those who actually listened to uh, John Bacall. And my idea was the following. In the sun, beryllium seven and proton make boron eight plus gamma. What if I run the movie in reverse? If I do the time reverse process of shining photon on boron eight and detecting the proton on beryllium seven. Quantum mechanics allows us to do that. It's called detailed balance. We, are, we, can, we can measure the measure the backward reaction and deduce from it the forward reaction by using detailed balance. It turns out to be that that's not my idea. Primakov already proposed this in 1951 and naturally we call it Primakov process. Primakov suggested that if we shine a beam of photon, real photon on a high Z nucleus, a high Z nucleus is in the cloud of virtual photon. So the real photon and the virtual photon will combine to make a pi zero, pi naught. And then the pi naught will decay to two real photon. If I measure these two real photon, I measure the invariant mass, I will have a peak at the mass of the pion, 135 MeV. And I know that I detected a, a pion. A pion was produced over here. If I measure the cross section, I would measure the the, the, the gamma width for this decay, okay? The electromagnetic width of the pi zero, the lifetime of the pi zero, 10 to the minus 16 seconds. This has been used, for example, the decay of the sigma naught to the lambda naught, electromagnetic decay is, is measured by Primakov process. So what's my idea? Shine a beam of boron A, interact with the virtual photon surrounding the high Z nucleus and measure the proton on the beryllium seven coming out. In order to do that, I need a beam of boron eight. Boron eight lives about one second, not so easy to get such a beam. I need to measure the proton on the beryllium seven, but most important, I need to be very far from the nucleus. I need to be about 40 Fermi from the nucleus. Once I get a contact between my beam and the nucleus, nuclear interaction takes into play and all hell break loose. I only want to deal with electromagnetic interaction, something that I know how to calculate. Okay? And by the way, I get enhancement. The pi over k squared give me a factor of a thousand enhancement. The number of virtual photon give me another a thousand uh, factor. So I get a, a factor of a million enhancement in the cross section, a large factor. So what do we do? We have a primary beam impinging on a target. Anything but the kitchen sink come out. We then separate only those things that we're interested in. We analyze it and we create a beam of boron eight GEV beam. Marsha, when you say you're, you have a primary beam, uh, what are you talking about? I think- Ah, uh, sorry, sorry. So from a cyclotron, I, I get carbon-12, for example, and I smash carbon-12 on a beryllium target. Everything comes out from this reaction, okay? So the primary beam is just your normal cyclotron, uh, um, you know, cyclotron beam that, uh, and the target is the normal nuclear physics target. In the analysis over here, I choose the beam of interest. Then I throw this beam of interest on a lead target, high Z nucleus. The boron and interact with the virtual photon cloud um, surrounding the uh, um, lead to a target. I measure in the forward angle, the beryllium seven and the proton. I measure the four momentum, energy and momentum. I measure the four momentum of the beryllium seven, the four momentum of the proton, Add them, take the absolute value square, and that's what's called the invariant mass. So I measure the invariant mass in this interaction, just like I did over here in the case of the proton. It turns out to be that since I'm not talking about highly relativistic uh, pro uh, process, the proton and the beryllium seven are not moving with very, very close to the speed of light. So the invariant mass is essentially just the relative energy. So I have a GeV beam over here but in the relative moment, uh, motion, 
I only have hundreds of KV. Okay? And here I, what I do is I measure a, a process which occurs in a star at the level of KV with GeV beam, all due to the fact that I'm able to measure the Primakov process. So here it is. Here is my, my beam uh, done at Riken. Uh, so I think uh, 1992 was the year we started. Uh, this is my beam. You see a lot of stuff comes out, but I can easily identify what I want. I uh, uh, interact the boron 8 with virtual photon, measure the proton on beryllium 7, and I look on the angular distribution between the proton and the beryllium, so the angle between the, the two parts. And this is calculation that I did with Carlos Bertulani. Uh, and this is not feet. This is, uh, uh, we are not varying thing. We're not fudging anything. We're trying. So you can see over here, we're slightly overestimating, but the shape is pretty good. I would say this is pretty good agreement with, with the data. We do it for relative energy of 500 to 750. Uh, we, we, are, we can choose the uh, relative energy. So uh, here it is uh, right in front of you. This is electromagnetic interaction. I know exactly how to calculate it. Nuclear, nuclear processes are down by at least a factor of 10, if not 100. Uh, and I can now measure with a uh, radioactive beam, with a, with a boron 8 radioactive beam, 110 MeV per nucleon, carbon 12 on beryllium 9, create the boron 8 beam. Uh, and, uh, and there you have it. Mind you, today we build at MSU a new facility, facility for rare ion beam, FRIB, $800 million facility, was just inaugurated while well, DOE took over uh, in September 2021. And the foundation for this, um, this beam is right here, right in front of you. In 1992, when we did this first experiment, uh, it became very clear that one can do a whole new set of measurement with radioactive beam. Boron 8 lives only one second. One second is a long enough time for us uh, because everything is uh, moving in, in, in a much, much faster, much faster way. So uh, a lot of, lot of things happen. Uh, there were a lot of... Uh, disagreement. Some people became disagreeable. There was a process of about 14 years. And here is the end of the 14 years process. My friend Eagle Talmi, Eagle Talmi together with uh, Harry Lipkin uh, um, founded the Weizmann Institute in 1951 in Israel. And he always tell me, you know Moshe, when a dog speak, it doesn't matter what it says. Uh, and this is something you can say about many things that we do in physics. You have a complicated system. The mere fact that you can do something about a complicated system, the mere fact that the dog speaks, it really doesn't matter what it says. But I say, no, let's listen to what the dog says. The dog is us, you know. Uh, we spoke about a, some complicated system. Again, this could be used for many things in physics. When you when you work out a very, very complicated thing and nobody believes in what you're doing and you finally convince people, you can tell them the dog has spoken. So normally, how would you do this measurement? You have a beryllium-7 target with a proton beam. This is what we call beryllium-7 P gamma, the notation I introduced before. And here are measurements that were done at Orsay, Seattle, and Weissman. In the Seattle workshop, we said, we only believe the Seattle and the Weissman result are the gold-plated result. You see the Orsay result, this one, they are far off. Seattle are the green, Weissman is the blue. Seattle and Weissman agree with each other, superbly uh, done experiment. We believe in this result. Well, the dog has spoken. Here is our result. GSI-1 and GSI-2, we move from Riken to a facility in Germany. You need not be concerned about this. And you can see, we, by the way, we publish our result four years 
before the Seattle and the Weizmann result. So people could not say, oh, you knew what you're looking for, so you found it. No, we were the first one to measure it. And then what we call the gold-plated result agreed with us, not we agree with them. So you can see the method that in 1992, people said, oh, it will never work, forget about it. It's too complicated. Uh, 14 years later, in 2006, I consider this as close, close. Uh, this is the, the last uh, publication on this subject. Uh, the Primakov process can be can be used, and it is being used now by a lot by a lot of people. Moshe, what's your vertical scale? Oh, sorry. Uh, if you recall, I did the astrophysical cross section factor over here. I determined the astrophysical cross section, the S. S factor. Thank you, Mike. Yep. So uh, this is a notation. This is the astrophysical cross for one interacting with seven. That's Hans Bader uh, invented this in 1939. So it's not S17, it's S17. One proton interacting with seven beryllium seven. And that's the astrophysical cross section factor. Thank you, Mike. Sometimes we, we, get, we get carried away with things that we uh, you know we don't even think anymore but uh, so this is the relative energy between the proton uh, and beryllium seven we measure in the laboratory in the sun we need to know it over here at 20 kV so we measure to 100 kV and in the sun we need to know it at 20 kV okay. so uh, first you need to have a good solid data uh, and now we have Seattle, Weizmann, and the Coulomb dissociation method. And then we ask theories, okay, extrapolate it to 20 kV. And basically today we think we know this cross section with about less than 10%. Okay. So the sun, when the sun will finish burning its helium, its hydrogen, it will start burning helium. And burning of helium is a very interesting process. It's a process in which three alpha particles burn to make carbon 12. But now imagine if you have three alpha particles, they all have to be in an A state. The phase space for this is very small, okay? So it turns out in 1950s, Sal Peter said, well, the alpha plus alpha create a resonance, which we call beryllium eight. It leaves 10 to the minus 16 seconds. So there is a certain concentration of beryllium eight in the star. So now we have two alpha particles, which are living for 10 to the minus 16 per second. The third one can come from any angle. So we open the phase space. If there's three body, the phase space is non-existent. But if the two of them, and then the third one can come from any angle. So Fred Hoyle came up with a wonderful idea. If beryllium-8 exists in stars, very small concentration, it leaves 10 to the minus 16 second, only 10, one part in, in 100 billion, but enough beryllium eight exists in the sun. I can now uh, bring a third one in and I can make carbon 12. But Fred Hall said, I exist, therefore there must be a state in carbon 12. It must be zero plus because these are spinless particles. And it must be at this energy. A state must exist in order to make the carbon 12 that you and I are made of. The state cannot be at too high of an energy. If it is too high in energy, it will decay back. The gamma width would be very small. It cannot be too low energy because then the alpha particle will not penetrate each other. It has to be at this energy. He predicted the state, and a year later it was found. And naturally, we call it oil state. This is the epitome of the anthropogenic principle. The laws of physics are finely tuned, so we can exist in order for us to study the laws of physics, the anthropogenic. The zero plus state must exist. In fact, take it the other way around. We exist because this zero plus state in carbon 12 exists. 
Now we have large cross section, resonance capture, not a direct capture. And that decays into making carbon 12. Well, it turns out to be that at the same time that we make carbon 12, carbon 12 can fuse some more and make oxygen 16. Again, in the notation of nuclear physics, I call it C12 alpha gamma. And here is the energy of alpha plus carbon 12, the energy of oxygen 16. We are somewhere over here. No resonance state. If there is resonance state, it's very easy to calculate the cross section. If there's no resonance state, it turns out to be extremely, extremely complex. So in helium burning, we create two uh, element, carbon and oxygen, but we don't know which what ratio. The carbon to oxygen ratio turned out to be of major importance in stellar uh, evolution. How come so? In stellar evolution, at the end of the life of the star, the star will collapse and create a supernova. And in the old days, we would just classify them. We saw some supernova, which showed evidence hydrogen is there, absorption line. Of hydrogen. So we call this type two. If there was no hydrogen line, we call it type one. If it was certain silicon line, we call it type 1A. I will concentrate today on the uh, stellar evolution of type 1A and type two supernova. Here is the uh, type two supernova. In 1985, Hans Bader and Jerry Burns says, that's it. We know, we understand how type two supernova explodes. It's time to write a Scientific American, okay? They write a Scientific American on type two supernova because they were so convinced that they understand it. So according to them, what we do is the following. A 25 solar mass star has about 15 solar masses of hydrogen. It burned hydrogen for about 7 million years. The sun burned hydrogen for 10 billion years. This is a lot faster because it's a much, much heavier, much uh, bigger star, 25 solar mass. When it burns hydrogen, it actually uses a different process. It's called the CNO process, but you need not be uh, concerned with this detail. Uh, and, and then it creates helium. Helium falls into the center by gravity. Uh, the temperature and the density goes up. We burn helium and we make a layer of carbon plus oxygen unknown ratio. And we go on and go on and eventually we make an iron core. Out here, we create heat, we create energy. This energy counterbalance the gravitational pull of the 25 solar masses. So out here, the gravity of the, of the many, many solar masses is balanced by the energy created over here. Iron can no longer be burned, does not create energy. So why doesn't the star collapse on its own? One solar masses of hydrogen. It turns out to be, and this was figured out by a young scientist uh, on his boat tour from India to uh, London, uh, Chandrasekhar. Uh, and he figured out that in here, in the iron cone, there are electrons. The electrons are fermion. Fermion don't like to sit on top of each other. There is a repulsion, the Pauli repulsion. So he figured out that the only reason why this one solar masses uh, iron doesn't collapse on its own because of this uh, quantum mechanical repulsion due to the fact that electrons are fermion. Imagine quantum mechanic at the level of one solar masses. It turns out to be that when we reach 1.4 solar masses, the Chandra Shaker limit, the iron core will implode on itself. Originally, you would think that it implode and then explode, but it turns out to be that the shock does not persist, the shock coalesce. And it turns out to be that the material over here is opaque to neutrinos. Imagine neutrinos cannot escape from the star, the material is so dense. It turns out to be that the explosion of the type two supernova is driven by the neutrinos 
in the center neutrino bubble. That's basically the essence of the paper by Beta and Brown. But now imagine if we have mainly carbon over here, we go helium burning, carbon burning, neon, et cetera, et cetera, to a, an explosion. But if we have oxygen, we go from hydrogen germing to helium to oxygen, and six months later, we have right away we go to supernova. The thermodynamic, the entropy is completely different. A star which is rich in oxygen will leave behind a stellar black hole, two or three solar masses black hole. And if it's rich in carbon, it would leave behind a neutron star. You see, here's an example where one number determine the final fate of a type two supernova. They see not. Oh. <clears throat> Everything okay? Okay, uh, that's type two supernova. Type one supernova. Type one supernova as we understand it today, uh, we have a binary system of a white dwarf. The sun at the end of its life will be a white dwarf, very condensed, one solar mass star. And it is stealing from a red giant, a very extended, uh, uh, a star, it's, extend, it's stealing hydrogen and it's building its mass. It started with one solar mass. When it gets to the Chandra Shaker limit, it explodes. This is what we call type 1a supernova. How do we know all of this? Well, it's right here. Here's Tycho Brahe, 1572, the first observation of type, type 1a supernova. A uh, graduate student of Tycho Brahe, Kepler, 30 years later, also saw a supernova. But that supernova was also observed in Korea. And here is the evidence. Now, if Gelman were here today, he would have told me, it will help if you show it right side up. If anybody can read Korean like Gelman, my apologies, here it is, right side up. And now if we look on this tablet and we only concentrate on this and we ignore all the gibberish, what are they telling us? At 10 p.m. at night, the gas star, we call it supernova, it was 10 degrees in Ophiochus. I don't know what Korean call Ophiochus, but we call Ophiochus Ophiochus. It is 110 degree in latitude. They tell us exactly where it is in the sun. It's dimmer than Jupiter. It tells us how bright it is. It's yellowish, red, and shaky. They tell us the spectroscopy. What's the temperature? What's, what's the color? And at 4 a.m., there was mist. So two brave people took the observation of Kepler. We call it the European observation and combine it with a Korean observation and created what we call a light curve. What's a light curve? We follow the magnitude, how bright the star is in the sun. What's magnitude? If you might recall, Aristotle uh, classified the element, the earth, and then there was a the sun, the moon, and then the stars classified, brighter star is one, the weakest that the eye can see is six. Uh, the Greek didn't start counting from zero. That came only later when the Muslim arrived. So luminous uh, magnitude, a star of magnitude one is bright, zero is brighter, minus one is even brighter. So that's the luminosity. But you can imagine my colleague, the astronomer using magnitude, the same units that Aristotle used. This is why I tell them, you are the second oldest profession. Anyhow, light curve. The light curve that was created by uh, these two uh, people, quite brave, uh, is what we do today. We look on, well, Kepler looked on this star and we went from magnitude two, which is quite bright, but not very bright, to minus three. The brightest star that we see today, uh, Sirius, is the magnitude zero. So this is about a factor of 50 
brighter than the brightest stars. So that was a, quite a bright, bright object. And they combined it. And the first thing that we see, after a hundred days of the observation, the decay curve is basically a decay of a lifetime of nickel 56, 112 days. Well, nickel decays to cobalt, uh, and that's 112 days lifetime. So we know that whatever happened over here is driven by nickel 56, 0.6 solar mass of nickel 56. Well, if we know how much nickel 56 we have, we should be able to tell how bright it should be. And it turns out that we are off by about a factor of three, okay? Uh, the, all, all the supernova that we know in our immediate neighborhood, 100 million light year away from us, they're all basically showing the same, the same, uh, and they're within a factor of three in the intensity. The magnitude over here, minus number means it's a brighter, so the, the uh, uh, luminosity is going up. In 1993, Philips found out a very interesting thing. If I take this curve and I stretch it in this way and in this way by the same factor, all of this curve fall on one universal curve within 8%. Wow, we have now calibration of type 1a supernova. So if we see a supernova at the end of the universe, we see a galaxy at the end of the universe, and the galaxy all of a sudden is twice as bright because a supernova creates as much light as an entire galaxy. We can tell how much light we measure by putting it on this calibration curve, we can actually tell how much light was emitted comparing the two numbers, we can measure distances. It's like a candle. The candle is next to your face. You see so many photons. If it's far away from you, you see less photon, but you know how many photon came out of the candle. So this is what we call cosmological candle. Wonderful, wonderful discovery of Philips in 1993, we can now measure distances all the way to the end of the universe. So coming back to our nuclear physics, we have a white wall, a carbon to oxygen of unknown mixture, and essentially we steal hydrogen from the red giant and we create a nickel core. 60% of one of the, of the star is nickel. That's what drives type 1a supernova. When we get to 1.4 solar masses, we implode our, our own uh, self gravity, the Chandra Shaker limit. So, how does the carbon to oxygen ratio affect uh, the amount of nickel? You can see right away three, three levels of different value for carbon to oxygen ratio produce different nickel. Well, we are giving Nobel Prize for people to measure type 1a supernova all based on an empirical curve. This is an empirical relationship. Our calibration curve is empirical. It would be nice to have some theoretical understanding and for that you need to understand the nuclear physics. So it is very little wonder the Willie Fowler in 1984, I was in his Nobel Prize speech at the APS meeting. At, at his Nobel Prize speech in the APS meeting, he declared the C12 alpha gamma, that's a nuclear physics notation, carbon 12 plus alpha making O16 plus gamma. He declared this the problem of paramount importance. And I don't know if any one of you have ever had the pleasure of listening to Willie Fowler, but the building are moving and shaking when, when Willie Fowler says, it is a problem of paramount importance. It is today a problem of paramount importance, as you will see. So in helium burning, to conclude, we have three alpha particles making carbon 12. We know this process because it goes through a nuclear state with 11% uncertainty. The C12 alpha gamma, namely carbon 12 plus alpha making O16, we don't know. We need to know it at 300 uh, kV. We measure at one MeV, we need to extrapolate to 300 kV. 
we don't know the carbon to oxygen ratio. We won't know if the supernova will end up as a black hole or a neutron star. Very important today as it was in 1984. It turns out that this cross section is dominated by two partial waves, P wave and D wave. So we use those spectroscopic amplitude, SE1 and SE2. From now on, you will hear only about SE1. It's the same spectroscopic uh, uh, factor, but now it's separated to two partial waves. So let's see how we do. 2006, the last modern experiment that was done, uh, Eurogam experiment, we measure angular distribution and we try to, well, we don't try, we then do what we call partial wave decomposition. In other words, the angular distribution in terms of Legendre polynomial. Well-known process, uh, all the angular momentum algebra goes into here. We know how to do it. So we now have two vector, vector for the E1 and vector for the E2, and they interfere. And they can have an angle of interference, which we call phi 1, 2. Okay? And that phi 1, 2 angle is what I'm going to concentrate. So we measure all this angular distribution. We do the partial wave decomposition. We get the E1 amplitude, A1 square, the E2 amplitude, A2 square, and the angle between the two vector. Where are we? In, in the 1990s, two theories found out a beautiful relationship for this phase angle phi 1, 2. And they say it can be derived from the elastic scattering, elastic phases, delta 2, elastic phases, delta 1, and arc tangents of the Zomerfeld parameter. They derived it in the formalism of our matrix. So our matrix is just one theory. Myself and another person, Carl Bruni, we said, no, this is not an R matrix, the consequence of R matrix. This is the consequence of unitarity. Unitarity allows you to relate elastic cross section to reaction cross section. So this relationship is required by quantum mechanics, required by unitarity. It is a consequence of the Watson theorem, which was applied to pion physics and Knudsen applied to, to nuclei and Carl Bruni and myself applied it to C12 alpha gamma. So here we are, all the measurement before the Eurogam, and I don't know what to make of it. But in 2006, we found out very, very nice data with a small error bar, this blue point. And they showed the prediction in their paper of our matrix. Okay, so you disagree with our matrix theory, no big deal. But when it turned out to be that this is not a prediction of our matrix, this is the prediction of quantum mechanics, prediction of unitarity, you know you have trouble. Here is what, what, what we do when we measure with, with photon. Those are gamma detector, they're segmented. Each one of this is $200,000. 15 of them, you can do the math. We're looking for gamma ray. So the gamma ray should be somewhere over here, eight and a half MeV. So somewhere over here at 8.5 MeV, there should be a gamma ray. And you can see we have trouble. And we are measuring at 1.4 MeV. We want to go down, okay? So low, low energy is even lower cross section. It's clearly, clearly some is, is time has come to do something very different. And now I'm, I'm getting to my, my, my work. Uh, I have now 10 minutes, but I'll do it. Again, in a star, alpha plus carbon 12 form O16. And I said, what if I shine gammas on O16 and look on the reverse process? Okay, nuclear astrophysics in the light of gamma B, light of gamma. Where do I get gamma rays? There is a very interesting uh, facility at Duke called High Intensity Gamma Source, eggs. They couldn't find a more cuter name. Uh, and it works the following. We have one GeV electron 
going in the ring. They come over here into magnet and they undulate. When they undulate, they emit light, green light. Right? So what we do is we make the length of the ring the same as the length of the photon going into the mirror, bouncing back and bouncing back. So as the electron goes around, the photon will meet it and they will now undulate in phase and create laser, free electron laser. That's the free electron laser facility in, in, in Duke. Somebody very smart 30 years ago said, well, now that we have free electron laser, let's now put another electron bunch, but only at half the distance. So the second electron bunch will meet the gamma as it comes back, will co do Compton scattering, and the green electron, uh, free electron laser will be boosted up in energy to 10 MeV. We'll get quasi-monochromatic gamma beam. We'll send it to my detector, the TPC detector. In here, we will do the nuclear, uh, nuclear uh, dissociation. The light will be emitted. We'll detect the light in PMTs. We will reflect the light into a uh, optoelectronic chain, and we take a CCD image. Of, of this. The paper that we just submitted to Nature has been published uh, in, in October. And I gave you in the abstract the, the reference, but for those of you who don't want to read Nature, there is an, a new journal, uh, the Innovation Platform. And basically everything that gets published in Nature goes immediately to the Innovation Platform with the idea that we need to explain to the common uh, non-expert uh, about new exciting physics. So we wrote this article and I gave you uh, uh, the reference for this article if you, if you wish to read it. Okay, uh, I think in, 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 in the, in the um, uh, time is pushing. So let me, let me, let me uh, not go into the detail how the detector works. Uh, here is the detector. Uh, the TPC is over here. The mirror is over here. The, Electronic chain is, uh, is over here. We read all the signals, the gas handling system that feed the gas, and of course the computer. Well, I told you that we have carbon and oxygen. We need to tell whether we are looking on carbon or on oxygen. CO2 has both carbon and oxygen. So we do what we call line shape analysis. Again, I'm getting to be very technical just to, to show you that we did some work, some real work. Uh, and here we uh, analyze a signal with a line shape expected for the O16 dissociation. That's the O16 dissociation. It fits very well. And here we analyze it with a carbon 12 dissociation. It fits very well. It doesn't fit for O16 and doesn't fit for carbon 12. So we can now tell whether the photon collide with O16 or carbon 12. And we can do a measurement on the photo dissociation of carbon 12 or the photo dissociation of O16. We cannot resolve the, the energy because unfortunately the energy is the same. So we cannot measure the total energy. But look at this. We have over here 70 counts. Our background, I don't even know what to, to plot the background, is maybe five or 10 counts. We have more than 10 to one signal to background ratio. Remember the background that we built before. Basically, I would do a background free experiment. We started by measuring with carbon 12. Why we measure with carbon 12? Because the case there was very clear. We have a one minus and a two plus. So there is an E1 amplitude and E2 amplitude, and we can see how they interfere. So as we change the energy, we move from mainly E2. Textbook example of Legendre polynomial of the order two, interfering with a P1, okay, one minus and two plus interference. We can do the phase shift analysis. We can get the E1 and the E2 amplitude. We do it on a known case, carbon 12. It was still good enough to publish as a PRL. Not the PRL is really a measure for, for how good is the work, but anyhow, we, we, we publish it and we showed that we can actually do uh, measure the E1 and the E2 amplitude and the phase angle. And then 
we moved on to uh, 016. It turned out that this was an experiment was done in 2012. We analyzed at that time the data on the dissociation of carbon 12, and we published it. Um, and it turned out to be a very interesting thing. But that data was sitting there from 2012 for eight years. And lucky for us, the pandemic came in. We couldn't get any data anywhere. I said to my student, well, we have data. It's sitting out there at Duke. Let's go get it. It's sitting on Duke. Imagine analyzing data that was taken in 2012, in 2020 during the pandemic. You have to go to all the handbook. And those of you who are running handbook, Make sure that you write everything in detail. Uh, it, it is a major undertaking to analyze data that was taken, was sitting there. We did it. We analyzed it during the pandemic and we published it in, uh, in uh, Nature. Well, we don't have much statistics, so it is what it is. Uh, we can say that we, we follow the theory but of course, we need more statistics. And I'm happy to tell you that on April 4, we're going back to Duke and we will measure it again with higher statistics. But it was good for nature to show that we have a new way to attack a problem that has been around with us for 40 years. And we hope that in fact, we will. So in comparison, this is the modern measurement that you do with the $3 million gamma rays. This is 512 that they measure, and this is the 512 that we measure. And we, we hope that indeed this would allow us to uh, bring this, the problem to conclusion. Where do we go from here? Uh, we are building a new detector, electronic readout. I will not go into the detail. Uh, the electronic readout is essentially uh, much superior to the optical readout. Uh, the multiplication is, uh, is not done in grid, it's done in gas electron multiplier jam. Uh, the readout is a very beautiful readout. Again, I will not, I will not uh, go into the detail. Uh, we, we build a mini detector, a prototype. You can see, we can see the tracks in the detector. And this is our final goal. At the Duke, uh, uh, Duke, we can go down to about 1.7 MeV. Uh, this is again the spectroscopic E1 and the spectroscopic E2. Uh, some time ago, I published a paper and showed that in fact the data has ambiguities. It can be two, two groups of data. So at Duke at 1.7, we can put a data point on this graph and can tell which is correct. However, in able to go to down to the energy, uh, in a star, we need to know the energy, the energy is 300 kV. We can measure down to one MeV, but in order to do that, we need a new facility, the extreme light infrastructure, nuclear physics facility that the European Union is building now in, uh, in uh, uh, Romania. Uh, well, that's a program that probably will go in 2025, uh, but again, uh, this is a problem that has been with us for more than 40 years. Uh, I can wait two or three years, and I hope you can too. And with that, I will conclude with thanking all my collaborator uh, in the process of the 22 years that we've been working on this problem. A lot of people joined us, and I thank all of them, each and one of them, for uh, working. It's been a great pleasure. But we're not yet there. We're not at the end of the road but we can see some light. And we hope it's not a train, right? The, hand, the light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you, Mike. And if there are any questions and if there is any time, I'm willing to. All right, so Moshe, thank you very much. Uh, let's open this up for questions. Um, and uh, if you have a question, if you could just raise your hand so I, I will see who's there. Let me just pull this thing up this way. <clears throat> All right. So any, anybody have any questions? I actually have one, which I'll get to in a minute. Okay, let, Moshe, let me ask you a question regarding the, uh, 
you said looking at either a neutron star or a black hole. Uh, now, uh, typically those things are very mass dependent uh, in, uh, in stellar evolution. I mean, you have to have a, uh, a sufficient mass to get to, to that point. So you didn't stress that. And I'm wondering how that actually folds in to this entire picture. Excellent, uh, excellent, yeah. excellent question. In fact, this is precisely what we want to determine. What is the mass for which a type two supernova will go to a, a black hole or a neutron star? Is it 15 solar masses, 20 solar masses? This is a very apropos question. Supernova 1907A is 17 solar masses. And it is right at the place where things get interesting. 25 solar masses, most likely, uh, it is mainly oxygen and most likely go to a, uh, a black hole. Uh, uh, 1987A, it's been, what is it, 30, 35 years ago, we still don't know if it went to a black hole or a neutron star. We haven't seen the neutron star, but that doesn't mean it's not there. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a big debate. And one aspect of that question is the carbon to oxygen ratio. The carbon to oxygen ratio will determine if 17 solar masses uh, 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 star uh, <clears throat> will uh, end up as a... There is another issue over there, which is the equation of state of the nuclear matter whether it's soft or hard, but I think that's been resolved. So yes, this is precisely the question we're trying to answer. The simulation that Jerry Brown and Hans Bader showed over here is for 25 solar masses. We can run it for 17 solar masses, provided that we know the carbon to oxygen ratio, and then we can say, okay, 17 solar masses will in fact end up as a black hole, or no, it will end up as a neutron star. So this is in fact, a very, very uh, apropos question. It's been around since 1987 because we don't know what 1987A. Uh, I'm referring over here to the supernova that uh, occurred in the Large Marginalny Cloud, which has been discovered in 1987, around January. So that's why we call it 1987A. And it's of great interest whether it ended up as a black hole or a neutron star. How precisely do you need to know that carbon to oxygen ratio oh, when we get to that? Okay. Uh, well, as precise as we can do, we cannot do better than uh, Would it be enough? I, I would say we need to go below 10%. Very hard. Very hard because at the level of 10%, we also need to now know the formation of carbon better than it's the moment it's 11%. But at the moment, it is, at the moment, look at this. Uh, um, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm you know, in the wrong direction. At the moment, look at the extrapolation. At the moment, we don't know it within a factor of 10. We measure up to here. And there is one model that extrapolate to here, and another that extrapolate to here. Factor of 10 difference. Okay, <laughs> you got your work cut out for you, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, and so uh, you said that um, Eli, you're expecting in 2025? Well, Eli right now is already operating with 210 petawatt laser. Yeah. But they do not produce gamma beam. Right. There is a company in uh, uh, Stanford called Lynchian. Uh, and they now have the contract, $43 million contract, to, to build the Vega variable electron gamma uh, uh, system. Uh, and they are supposed to uh, uh, provide the beam in May 2023. Why May 2023? That's the end of the fiscal year of the European Union. And the European Union give you so much money in so many uh, fiscal cycle. If you don't do what you did by that fisc fiscal cycle, the money goes away. 
So they have to deliver by May 2023. I give them another year or another two to actually make a, 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 a system that we can do an experiment with. Um, well, uh, anybody, any other questions? Uh, we've uh, reached beyond the, uh, the hour, so. Um, if there are no other questions, uh, then let's thank our speaker again. Uh, this is a, for any of you who get involved in astronomy as I have somewhat later in my career, uh, this is really a, 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 a very serious question uh, that Moshe and his collaborators are trying to address. It's been around for quite a long time and uh, just proves that, you know, uh, technology needs to keep pace with our uh, quest for knowledge. So Moshe, once again, thank you very much. And uh, thank everybody else for their attention. Uh, I, wish, and, I wish I could see you in, in person sometime. Yeah, that, that would be wonderful when we can arrange that. Terrific. Okay, thank you again. Thank you, Mike. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> I didn't realize how tough this problem was. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen, it's uh, really, we are talking about, first experiment was done in 1974. Yeah. You know, Mike, every uh, long-term, uh, long-range plan of nuclear physics, uh, so uh, 2011, 2015, and we're supposed to have another one now, every one of them says this is the number one problem in nuclear astrophysics. Well, it's understandable. Um, so anyway, uh, I got to go on to another Zoom thing right now. And uh, uh, thanks for inviting me. Well, I think it was terrific. I think people really, uh, you, I, you know, this is sort of a hybrid thing where a whole bunch of people are in the colloquium room and then a whole bunch of people on Zoom. But uh, the the was plan was to move everything in person. I don't know whether that's actually going to happen. I suspect it will. But I'm not sure how what that's going to do to the audience. I mean, we usually run between the you know total when we had everything in person. You'd have about 35 people or more. Uh, but under the circumstances, if this thing's all in person, I don't know what we would actually get. I don't know. Um, it's it's tough to uh, predict. But do, so, do you think do you think the level was okay for? Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I look. I think that uh, you got into a few things that were probably uh, a little bit, um, how should I put it, uh, more um, uh, field specific. Um, I mean, I'm familiar with a lot of this stuff, but and and there are I mean, certainly our theorists are uh, some of the experimentalists who uh, you know work more in either condensed matter physics or whatever might not uh, know some of the the terminology. Um, you, you explain the nuclear physics, how you write things down, but then you got into the various kinds of partial wave analysis. I don't know. I can't comment uh, on, mm. on, on how people uh, reacted to that. But you certainly made the case for why this is important. And I think that was very, very valuable. So, good, Mike. All righty. Nice. So uh, we will continue to uh, our... Uh, conversation about what's happening at Duke once you get some information. Give me a buzz. Yeah, no, they, they want to finish it this week. Okay, well, let me know. Uh, uh, Barley, the, the guy that we met, yes. Wesley, he called me about 15 minutes before the colloquium. Yeah. And uh, he asked me to retract the letter to- uh, uh, Rosa. Rosa, which I did. And I yeah. carbon copied Duke. Okay. Is they, they yeah, say, it's, you're, you're premature in this. That's what I was yeah, trying to get across. It was, it was a mistake. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, he, he said they are willing to finish the whole thing, but they are very upset about this. And just I said, fine. I learned my lesson the hard way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. So we'll see. Maybe in a week we will hear from them. We are in, really. Well, let me know. Let me know what's going on. We're really up against the wall because yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. Two, two months is not a long time to prepare an experiment.